Hello, I'm Dr. Marty Martin, and I'm a faculty member at DePaul University in the city of Chicago. In this five-question series, our focus will be on epidemiology. And that's kind of a mouthful, epidemiology. And I'll break it down so that way it makes sense for you. So first, why study epidemiology? There's several reasons. So one is you want to think about the distribution and health and disease within a population. So not only do you want to think about what happens to an individual patient, but what happens to a group of patients in a hospital, let's say, or a cluster of patients in a community, could be a family, could be a church, could be a university, nursery school, or within a larger population, maybe a city, maybe a regional area, maybe a nation. So epidemiology is important to study so that way you can find ways to enhance the health and the well-being of the population. So epi, for short, is not only about disease, illness, and disability, but also health and well-being. You also want to study epidemiology to ensure that diseases are identified early so that that way you can slow down the progression of the disease or minimize long-term consequences. And finally, you want to study epidemiology to equip individuals who may be diagnosed with a disease such that they can rebound quickly to restore optimal functioning. Those are the three reasons why you want to study epidemiology. Which begs the question, what is epidemiology? So let me ask, let's pause for a minute and actually read to you a definition that comes from one of the leading textbooks in epidemiology. Epidemiology is concerned with the distribution and determinants of health and diseases, morbidity, injuries, disability, and mortality in populations, not in individuals, but in populations. Let me give you another piece of that definition. Epidemiologic studies are applied to the control of health problems, again, in populations. So epidemiology does have an academic side, but the focal point is more on the applied side so you can control diseases, illness, disability within a defined population. So this begs another question, what is health? We all have a sense of disease and illness and disability, but not health. The World Health Organization came out with their definition of health that has really been embraced by a number of different healthcare organizations. And that's worth reading line by line as well. Health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. That's quite a broad definition of health. But that's an important definition to keep in mind. Because if you'll remember, epidemiologists study both health and well-being, as defined here, as well as disease, illness, and disability. So our focal point is really going to be on managerial epidemiology, as well as marketing epidemiology. So what is that? Fundamentally, it's the application of tools and concepts of epidemiology to make decisions. So to make decisions in the pharmaceutical sector, life sciences, health insurance, healthcare delivery, medical devices. And you'll note a quote there by John J. Fennin, Jr. from a health system that talks about how he looks at the application of epidemiology as it relates to a healthcare organization. So it has a practical definition and a practical application. So you still may not be convinced and still may be asking yourself the question, so what skills will I learn if I study epidemiology? Several. First is the use of an interdisciplinary approach. So epidemiology draws from biostatistics, operations research, traditional public health, clinical medicine, increasingly informatics, sociology, so it's interdisciplinary. The other is the use of the scientific method. So it really goes through all the things that are true of the biomedical sciences in its approach. Next, the enhancement of critical thinking. What does that actually mean? It means reasoning by analogy. So you may look at what happened in the Middle Ages with the bubonic plague 
when one third of the European population was killed to what happened during the 1918 influenza in the United States, where over a million people were killed, to what happened with SARS, to what may happen down the road. So use of analogy. The other is making deductions from ideas and data. So in a lot of cases in epidemiology, you have some data, you're observing something, something happens, then you have to deduce or draw meaning from that. Lastly, remember, epidemiology is about the control of health problems. So how do you solve problems? And problems that can have an impact, not just on one patient or one individual, not just a single family, but large numbers. Think about the bubonic plague during the Middle Ages. One third of the European population was killed. One out of three. 1918 influenza, one million. Those are large numbers. That's why epidemiology is important. Some other skills you'll learn too is the use of quantitative as well as computer methods. So there's some software like EpiInfo, also people drawing through some of the large EHRs, Epic, McKesson, drawing from CDC databases. So how do you manipulate that data? And there's this emerging field of predictive analytics, and epidemiologists are really instrumentally involved in that. Because not only do you want to control something after it happens, but ideally what you want to do is predict and prevent the occurrence. So within epidemiology, that's called surveillance. Uh, two other skills you'll learn, communication skills. So if there's an outbreak of some type of virus, maybe within a hospital, you'll find a public health uh, official, commissioner of health, they'll get on the news and they'll say to the population, you know, here's the risk, this is what you should do. What you don't want to do is stir up a panic because if people panic and they're fearful of their life or well-being, they'll do weird and crazy things. The next skill is going to seem somewhat odd, but it's the inculcation of aesthetic values. What's, what's aesthetic? Aesthetic is really the science of beauty. So you're thinking, wait a minute, Marty, you're talking about disease, illness, infirmity, you know, plagues, Ebola. What's beautiful about that? Well, really, nothing's beautiful about that. But if you look at classic books like The Jungle by Upton Sinclair, his key message was workplaces need to make sure that they take care of their people from an occupational point of view to really control kind of uh, things that are controllable that have a negative impact on health. But he didn't do it in an academic paper. He didn't do it in some scientific treatise. He did it in the form of a novel. So, but people got the key message. Another recent example is the movie Contagion, kind of derived from Hollywood. It's fun, it's entertaining, it's a thriller, but there are also some key public health messages there. So what's important to remember is that you're developing a number of skills when you study epidemiology. Now, is there an ethical component to epidemiology? There is an ethical component. One of the classic things that occurred in our country not so long ago was the Tuskegee experiment. So back in 1932, kind of during the midst of the Depression, the United States Public Health Service decided they wanted to conduct a study. And the title of the study was The Tuskegee Study of Untreated Syphilis in the Negro Male. So Negro was the term that was used back then. So again, what's the name of that study? The Tuskegee Study of Untreated Syphilis in the Negro Male. So this is what happened in the study is that they got an African-American population in Tuskegee, Alabama, and then some of them already had syphilis, and they wanted to look at what's called the pathogenesis of the disease. So they wanted to follow them without treatment to see how the disease progressed. Now that in and of itself, you say, well, in 1932 there wasn't a treatment, so maybe not such a bad idea. But in 1947 it became known that penicillin was efficacious, worked, in the treatment of syphilis. That's when the ethical issue arose. So in 1947, it was known that if we give these individuals penicillin, we can treat the syphilis. So what do you do? Do you give them the syphilis and mess up the study? I mean, excuse me, not the syphilis. Do you give them the penicillin and mess up the study? Or do you withhold the penicillin so that way you have a nice, clean, robust study. Unfortunately, what happened is they withheld the penicillin. 
and then it was later discovered and found out. When was it found out? 1973. Not so long ago, 1973. The end of the story is there was a $10 million settlement. So what arose from that, like the American College of Epidemiology and other medical, scientific, nursing, and healthcare organizations said, this cannot happen anymore in the United States. So people gathered together and they began to look at things like informed consent, institutional review boards. So if you're working for a hospital or a university, before you conduct research on humans, it has to go through human subject review or an IRB, Institutional Review Board, to make sure that these types of things don't happen in the future. So hopefully I've addressed for you, why study epidemiology? What are the skills that I will acquire if I study epidemiology? And exactly what is it? So what I challenge you to do is when you're having a conversation with a loved one, friend, or colleague, just throw out that word epidemiology, and they may look at you kind of funny, but now you know how to explain to them what epidemiology is and why they should care. Thank you very much.